Hello, everyone. Today is May 27, 2021. My name is Marcio Migon. I am advisor to the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovations, MCTI, and currently also coordinator of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. CGI.br, a multi-sectorial committee responsible for monitoring, debating, and establishing a series of guidelines related to the development of the internet in Brazil. CGI today is 25 years, and that is made of a number of players of the civil society and some governmental agents. The system in this past 25 years, the system has been updated and those contributions that have been given to the leg legislation has been just amazing. In addition to the Internet Civil Market, the Internet Steering Committee is of great contribution to establish the civil mark of Internet in Brazil and also LGBT where the protection data has been currently deployed. And with that, we have everything been forecast in our act since this year. And with that, I would like to open for internet and the regulation of our platforms. This is not just a Brazilian problem, but a global one that has been debated all over Australia, German, Germany that has adopted an antitrust approach, ODCE, and the United States that have the whole framework. That has been one of the models for global development. With the pandemic, we had speeded up all the process. And with that, we had improved the adoption of digital platforms as part of our lives. Without them, it would not be possible to reach a number of actions in the middle of this pandemic. Within that period, the register.br, which is an organization that collects resources and allows NIC.br as well as CGI.br, is responsible for 10% of a registered domain. That's the largest in the world, and that is related to a number that had guaranteed the resilience and the quality to all Brazilians. Similarly, the emergence of the big techs with digital platforms has worried a number of players in the civil society and in the governmental sector by the ability to control data flow in the internet. Business models based in the democratic process, data analysis, individual behavior, new ways to work, as well as a number of other daily actions, they drive a number of actions that will go beyond the organized society.
que necessárias, calcadas na indústria e a complexidade do visto humano. E também, o passo é os arranjos tradicionados precisa ser o modelo multissetorial precisa ser acompanhado e aperfeiçoado. That multi-stakeholder model has to be enhanced and updated. It's not by any coincidence that we had improved the debate about digital platforms. And now they have a type of power which is not yet understood. There is a task force that aims to regulate platforms, which aims to study national and global regulation of digital platforms and to promote discussion, technical notes and standards. Under Henrique Falara, who is our advisors, we want to promote the dialogue about uh, that, uh, the power of the platforms, their business models. I'm so sorry, his connection is quite bad. So the debates which will feature professionals that are internationally acknowledged, state of art, as some specific tools that are being deployed to regulate our sector. This is the first step to consider some challenges of a country with some specificities and with great opportunity to collaborate to the national and global debate. I wish you all a fruitful debate and a great event to all who will participate. Now I hand over to you, Enrique. Well, Marcio, we could barely hear your introducing speech. I really apologize. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Today, we are closing the first cycle of a platforms regulation. This is a endeavor conducted by CGI, and that was our first step towards that direction. We hope to carry out in our second semester some other workshops to continue this discussion. We hope to involve a communication means, consumers, and some other players who are part of this great debate. This morning, we had a very interesting panel about the use of tools for antitrust to defeat the main power of the platforms. And last Thursday, we had a panel with a representative of, of OC, ODCE, OCD, I should say, sorry, that should uh, address some uh, dangerous, con harmful content. And Professor Daphne from Stanford has addressed some tools and models to improve uh, content moderations. Today we have Annabelle from the business school uh, from the UK, Annabelle Gower, and Mariana Valente, he is our moderator, director from Internet Labs, and a professor at Innsbruck University. I will hand over to Mariana, who will moderate this debate, and also she'll be responsible to grab questions that will be addressed from our audience. This session is being recorded and translated into Portuguese, English, and Spanish. You'll be able to follow this talk as as well as other talks in our YouTube channel. Mariana, now I hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Migon. 
I also like to thank CGI and Nick Biar for the kind invitation. It's a great honor to be part of this panel that will close this cycle of debates. And having said that, I will switch to English so I can talk directly to Annabel Gower. And thanks for accepting the invitation and being here. Annabelle is one of the most important global voices doing research and making concrete propositions for policies to address the power of digital platforms nowadays. Professor Annabelle and Nick Zunisic's recent study delivered to the European Parliament on economic and socio social effects of online platforms is a comprehensive analysis of both the positive effects of different types of platforms, but also of where regulation and enforcement is lacking. She also presents concrete policy options following the problems she identifies in those in that report. Um, Annabelle's production is very necessary at the moment, the way I see it, because she has this holistic approach that at the same time takes two steps back in specific policy discussions and specific areas. And then to me, it seems that she sets the stage for making these discussions again, but then understanding them as part of a broader context that needs to be tackled both panoramically and in detail because of how platforms currently structure the economic, social, the political, the cultural. This is all especially important in this moment of sanitary emergency and how the COVID crisis has catalyzed ongoing processes. And it has led at the same time to widespread use of certain technologies, but more concentration in the digital sector, as well, of course, as deepening inequalities, both globally and inside societies. And therefore, very happy to welcome Annabel to the cycle of discussions that the CGI has organized. And uh, I wanted to tell you, Annabel, that I think you're the right person to be closing this cycle. Let me introduce her more formally. Annabel Gower is chaired professor in digital economy and the director of the Center of Digital Economy at the University of Surrey Business School. She is also a visiting professor of strategy and innovation at Oxford University, Said Business School. She's also a pioneering scholar on digital platforms and innovation ecosystems. She's a highly cited author of 30 articles and four books, including The Business of Platforms, Strategy in the Age of Digital Competition, Innovation and Power. Professor Gore has advised the European Commission as an expert in the Observatory of the Online Platform Economy, and she's recently published a report for the European Parliament, Online Platforms, Economic and Societal Effects. That's the report that I was mentioning just before. So welcome. The floor is yours, Annabelle. Thank you. Uh, Professor Valente, thank you. And thank you very much to... Uh, to a CGI uh, to invite me. I am very honored to speak with you. And I believe this is my first time speaking to a, an audience in Brazil and uh, in South America. Um, I would like to offer some thoughts on, um, on uh, digital platforms, uh, their sources of power and options for regulation. So I have prepared some slides and um, I will be sharing them now. Can you see them? Yeah. Okay, um, and thank you very much for, for this generous uh, introduction. So, um, so platforms today, uh, we hear this word everywhere, and we don't always know what that means. Um, so I would like to, to give you just some example. We, we understand about Google, Apple, Facebook, they are platforms, but I would like to start my presentation to clarify what, what, what platforms actually mean and to explain that this concept actually predates digital. It existed before. But one of the key examples of platforms, if you think about the iPhone, you have the iPhone with all these apps and all the innovators around the iPhone who make the applications. They are part of um, the Apple ecosystem. And here, iPhone has actually a, a platform which is made of um, two different elements. 
One is the iOS, which is an operating system, which is a foundation, uh, a foundational technology with connectors that come out of the technology. You can think of them as APIs, application programming interfaces. And um, this foundation technology makes it easier to lots and lots of innovators all around the world as long as they can program some software, it's easy for them to develop a, an app, which then can be compatible to the connector of iOS. So we all know that. The advantage of this type of, of design and technology is that uh, uh, it can facilitate the emergence of, of innovation on products, services, or technologies that are complementary uh, to the foundational technology. Apple also has another platform, which is the App Store. And here it's uh, what I call a transaction platform. So this is really an online marketplace where um, Apple facilitates the connection between uh, vendors of these apps and uh, users of, of, of the iPhone. So that's a, an important example. Another example will be a uh, uh, you know, fundamental um, uh, platform of Windows as, a, as an operating system. Again, we had a whole ecosystem of applications that were complementary to, that were complementary to, um, to, um, to, um, uh, to, to Windows and, uh, um, and that was a very important platform, still is. Um, Google is a platform in the sense that if you think about Google search, it connects advertisers on one hand and users on the other hand. And obviously, Google has expanded into a, a, a number of markets, but um, um, principally, it plays the role of uh, offering different value to different sides of the markets. And then the list goes on and on. We have a social uh, media uh, we have uh, professional social networks like LinkedIn and then Facebook, Twitter, TripAdvisor, Waze. What do all these products and technologies have in common? Forget the digital aspect, forget the internet aspect, forget even the software aspect. Let's focus on the way they are designed. And let's think about the simple objects of a Lego block that you have all played with and your, and your children are playing with. If you think about Lego blocks, they exist in a, a variety of different colors and they have different lengths and some of them have different heights. But one part of their design is the same for every piece of Lego block. And these are the connectors, those elevated cylinder that are on top of the Lego blocks. They all have exactly the same dimension across all the different Lego blocks and the distance between them is exactly the same. That is a physical interface. That is a connector that allows very interesting things to happen. And we will see that all platforms have connectors, but there may be invisible connectors. And that's why people find this analogy of the Lego block helpful. So I have here an example of a, of a creative artist, a sculpture, who is building a whole new sculpture, which is a system made of building blocks. These are the components here, which happen to be Lego. And the idea I wanted to convey with this image is that when you have modules with standardized interfaces, that allows individuals and organizations to assemble them, to combine them, to mix and match them, to create system out of these building blocks. Here, we see a logic which is different from the traditional logic of manufacturing and supply chain. We understand since the days of Adam Smith that uh, there is value into specialization, that different companies can make different kind of, of, of products. When you look inside a, a, a car, for example, you see that there is an engine, you see that there is a steering wheel. You see that you have uh, different parts of the car. The assembler of the car, the original equipment manufacturer like Volvo or Volkswagen or, or General Motors, they don't necessarily make every single component of the car. They make some core components, but they outsource um, to other companies, and many of them are in Brazil, 
development of and and uh, the manufacturing of 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 subsystems but at the end they integrate the whole thing and then they sell it so we have a kind of division of labor here but the assembler is the one who designed the whole system who decided what it was going to be used for it's going to be an automobile it needs to have a steering wheel it needs to have doors it needs to have an engine and then that decides to allocate to different firms within its supply chain who is going to do the sub part in a in a platform design logic that logic is inverted you don't start with the whole automobile or the whole system break it down into parts and allocate it into into manufacturers of subsystem in a design of a platform you start with an engine you start with a component of a larger system but you don't know what the overall system is going to be necessarily so in this example of the of the of the sculpture here this sculpture you see has decided to make a hand from which is springing a whole city but he could make many many other designs so what we see here is that when you think of platforms as a foundation for innovation there is a versatility in the way it can be used to facilitate innovation on complements let me move on now to the next slide so uh uh economists have started to look at platforms since uh, the early 2000s and they started to look at platforms in in different contexts than IT they started to look at platforms in the context of mobile payment and online marketplaces and it took a while to uh, analysts and researchers to understand whether the way economists spoke about platforms and the way engineers spoke about platforms whether they were speaking about completely different animals or whether in fact there was some commonality between them and um and the paper that i wrote in 2014 uh, which was called bridging differing perspectives on technological platforms uh, which has been uh, cited quite a lot people found it very helpful establishes the commonality uh between the um, economics view and the engineering view but let me zoom in a little more into the more economic view economists tend to speak of platforms as multi-sided they think of them as locus of exchange really marketplaces that facilitate exchange or transaction between different what they call sides of the markets uh so for example if you're uber one side of the market it will be the uber drivers and another side is going to be the uber uh, the uber the uber um, riders if you're airbnb one side are going to be those people who want to uh, rent a flat or a house and stay there for a few days or a week or more the other side are going to be those who own those flats or houses and want to rent them out eBay is, is is again an example there. So some people have asked okay so multi-sided platforms have two sides but don't every firm have two sides buyer side and seller side? Doesn't that mean that every firm is a platform? And there was a helpful work by uh, Andre Hadju and uh, Julian Wright who clarified that multi-sided platform are different from other types of firms such as resellers who buy an input and then and then resell it like when you go to a supermarket and you're going to buy i don't know Kellogg's corn flakes cereal the supermarket has bought the cereal and then resold it but they had taken ownership of the good and a vertically integrated firm which where you would have if you want to stay with the example of the supermarket they would buy the supplier and then resell the good and you also have another set of uh, relationships called a uh, input suppliers so here you can think about intel microprocessor which supplies an input which is a microprocessor and then sells it to for example a lenovo and which will integrate it within a system that then will be sold so what is let's dig a little bit deeper into the structure of businesses that are calling themselves platforms and i make a distinction between transaction platforms 
and innovation platforms. Economists really speak about platform, they mostly speak about transaction platforms. The example here that I think in this crowd everybody understand, if we speak about, for example, Google and Google search as a service, one side will have advertisers and the other side will have um, will have uh, people like you and me who want to search result. Um, we find that contrary to traditional businesses where you only have two actors, a buyer and a seller, the buyer in a traditional business is going to want to buy a particular good and service that the seller has to sell. And in exchange, he will give the money to the seller. So we have product or service going this way, money going that way. That's what a transaction is, requires two players. By contrast, a platform business model is going to require three players, three players involved into a triangular relationship. And the platform is going to be a special kind of intermediary. It will be an intermediary between side one and side two. The value that the, the, the platform creates is very specific. It allows side one to connect to side two, and it allows side two to connect to side one. Sometimes people from side one are desperately desiring to connect to side two. For example, advertisers very much want to connect uh, to the end users and know, for example, when they will be available to be susceptible to advertising of a particular good and service. It may well be the case in some platforms that the other side is not so interested into being connected to the first side. When I go onto Google search, I don't go there because I very much hope that the advertising on the side of the screen is gonna be interesting. That's not why I go there. But what you need to have as a necessary condition to create platform businesses is that at least one side is only there because thanks to the platform in the middle, they can have access to the other side. So then there are various strategies through which firms create business models that are platform business models. Sometimes they give away some service or some, some, some product or some value for free to one side. And we are very familiar with those uh, advertising-based models where uh, end users end up connecting to the platforms for free, which means they don't pay directly in monetary terms. But as we all know, the way they pay is that with their attention and their ability to be traced and monitored, the data that they generate in the context of their use of the platform has monetary value that then the platform can monetize and sell um, to, um, to, to, to the other side. So we are very familiar with that. Perhaps I shall add that platforms grow very fast because of so-called network effects. And the concept of network effects is really rather simple. It says that some technologies have this facility, this, this uh, uh, characteristic that the more people use it, the more useful it becomes. So the more people are on a telephone network, the more the network becomes. Uh, the more, uh, the more uh, cities a, tr a, a railroad network is going to connect to, the more useful that railroad is going to be. Uh, platforms all have network effects, but it's a different kind of network effect. It's not just a, a, a direct kind of network effect. The more people like me in the network there is, the more useful it is. It's a, it's a network effect across sides. So what you want is advertisers want, they don't want lots of advertisers like them. They want lots of other users on the other side. If I'm a buyer on eBay, what I want is lots of sellers on eBay on the other side. If I'm a seller on eBay, I want lots of buyers on the other side. We find that these network effect becomes basically self-fulfilling uh, feedback loop that facilitates uh, growth of, of platforms. And so with these indirect network effects will exist in all the platform businesses that you know, whether it's, you know, Android developers and Android users, the more of one there is, the more helpful it is to the others, or uh, between uh, uh, Airbnb rooms and Airbnb renters, or between eBay buyers and eBay sellers. So each side attracts more of the other, and that becomes an engine of growth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's useful to, to, to add to this view of platforms as a locus of transaction and exchange an understanding that many platforms 
also have this role of facilitating innovation on complementary products, services, and technologies that are connectable, compatible, interoperable with the foundational uh, platform. And so, the key uh, in which uh, the key way in which platforms create value is really to open themselves up to third-party contributions. And in a world where lots of people have um, ideas, um, capabilities, it's fantastic to have. Uh, tools that can tap into the innovative capabilities of others without requiring them to be employees or to be suppliers. Now, you may have recognized Mark Andreessen, who is a venture capitalist, founders of Netscape. Uh, um, uh, he said a platform is a system that can be adapted to countless needs and niches. The original platform developer could not even have contemplated. So what you have here is a division of labor, but not the traditional division of labor of Adam Smith. You have a division of labor in the process of innovation, when you provide a kind of platform infrastructure that facilitates innovation uh, by lots and lots of people. So innovation platforms are technologies that facilitate the development of complementary innovation. And that logic really comes from, if you think about product families, when uh, companies develop portfolio of products, for, they don't have to invent back from scratch everything they reuse they reuse over a different uh, maybe market segments, some core components, which then they can customize and make a little bit different. So this, this, uh, this design approach existed pre-digital. And what you see here is in the automotive industry, how a platform design is very common. You have uh, different families of cars, sports utility, compact, multi-purpose, family hatchback. And what the platform is in that environment is really kind of a skeleton of, uh, you know, an axle, uh, large modules, an information system that is a basic fundamental architecture that will be there from model to model within that product family. And then in order to create differentiation and customization, the manufacturer is going to add maybe a more powerful engine or more options um, to, to, to adapt to different market segments. So the design approach of platform is trying to get the best of both worlds. It's trying to get the benefits of differentiation with the power of economies of scale. So uh, um, in a paper I wrote a few years ago, I explained that actually uh, we can see platforms within firms. And that's an example of a product family with Black & Decker. Or here is Philips, you know, in the, this, is a, this is a clever hairdryer where you can have multiple, uh, multiple plugins or add-ons. One's going to make your hair curly, one's going to make your hair flat, one is going to, to just blow hair. But they reuse always the same, the same basis. You can also have platforms in the supply chain, like I just explained with the automotive industry. What you can have here is um, the platform sharing these interfaces only with a small number of suppliers, not the whole world, but with their own suppliers. They will, uh, for example, the automotive industry uh, manufacturer will share the connection information to say the engines manufacturer and will say to them, okay, I don't care what you do inside your engine, but it needs to fit in this space. And these are the characteristics of the connectors, electrical and, and otherwise, that it has to fit within a system that I design. And then the, the, the platform that we're familiar with today, which are those platforms within an ecosystem where the interfaces are much more open and when uh, the relationship between the platform owner and those innovators is a much more vague relationship. It's not employee-employer. It's not buyer-supplier. It is something that is being defined now as governance of the ecosystem. And we see now in, in the context of regulation of platform that this is an open question as to what is the responsibility of the platform owner vis-a-vis -vis the developers of complement. What is the responsibility or the liability of the users of the platform, if they are business users or if they are if they are individual users. And we don't really have a set of rules and a set of laws, just like we had, you know, we had a rule of the enterprise. And uh, over the years, that, that body of law became more, uh, more uh, developed. For example, the notion that there would be a, a responsibility of an employer if uh, an employee would get hurt 
in the context of its work. That is actually a, a, a regulatory innovation that came after, after uh, you know, many, many years after the Industrial Revolution. And for many years, you know, kids would be sent into the mine and, and people would get, uh, would get sick of doing a very dangerous work and there was no law to protect them. Right. Then you also have different rules that establish the modalities and the responsibilities between buyers and suppliers within a supply chain. And we start now again to see a development of laws in that in that uh, in that area. So, for example, to which extent is Zara responsible, uh, the, the, the clothing manufacturing uh, uh, and, and retailer, when one of its suppliers in Bangladesh is using, uh, you know, uh, maybe slave labor or doesn't provide safety conditions to, to its workers. So the responsibility and the mutual uh, rights and um, a, a along those different um, modalities of economic uh, relationships is always something that comes after the fact, after the fact. Uh, and that is precisely what we start to see now with platforms and, and the, the way they govern the ecosystems. And so we see now a whole sorts of questions around that go all the way from should Facebook monitor content? Uh, to which extent are they uh, liable or should they be liable for content that may be harmful? Um, um, or are they really just a neutral platform and it's the responsibility of users, right? To which extent uh, Uber should be responsible if one of the drivers that is not an employee of Uber, that is not even a supplier to Uber, starts to you know misbehave vis-a-vis -a, -vis a driver. Um, to which extent is uh, is uh, is um, Uber again responsible to pay for sick pay, or sick leave, or uh, or if there is an accident, or when one of the drivers is sick or has an accident? These rules have not yet been developed. But the debate about the regulation of platform is in full swing. In Europe, uh, there have been quite a lot of propositions, but also all over the world, there's been a lot of activity around uh, clarifying the rules and the responsibilities of platforms and the associated ecosystem. And uh, it is perfectly normal that these things take a little longer than just the phenomenon, because not even companies have completely understood how platforms work. Uh, incumbent firms are having difficulty adapting to this new way of competing and new way of innovating. So you can just imagine how regulators who come from the world of law, who come from the world of politics, are not necessarily either businessmen or technologists, how, how difficult it can be to understand the different facets of the phenomenon. So we are now in a, in a, in a situation of a lot of, um, a lot of ferment, a lot of debate, a lot of uh, polarization that reflects the underlying values of those who, um, who, who, who have those positions. It's also a very opportune time to try to shape the digital economy, to try to shape the future of the internet, to try to, to, try to get the best of what this technology and this connection has to offer. And I think that we have to reflect how the situation has changed from about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was uh, finishing my PhD at MIT. Uh, it was just before the bubble, the, 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 inter the internet, first internet bubble burst. It was a huge uh, time of enthusiasm and belief into the democratization power of the internet, that everyone was going to have a voice, everybody can be an author, everyone can be published. And the old structures of powers were going to be eroded by this fantastic wave of, of connectivity. It is uh, painfully ironic to see that 20 years later, yes, of course, we are covered by a fabric of connectivity all around the world and we can connect to the internet in many ways. But what we see is that the creation of value is being very fragmented. So lots of people and everyone really is creating value just by connecting to the internet, not just receiving value. But the capture of the profit and the capture of the data is being very centralized. And there is a, a, a social um, awareness of the possible danger and the real danger of a surveillance society, of being manipulated by data, of... Um, 
of uh, of uh, enormous uh, financial profits accruing to a small number of companies. Uh, we, we call GAFAM usually, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Some people put Microsoft in, some are not. And and uh, and that's why you see in in Europe a new proposal of regulation specifically targeted towards uh, what they call the gatekeeper platforms. Or uh, the UK has their own uh, new regulation underway. They call platforms with strategic market status. So they understand, and maybe they understood from GDPR as well, that you cannot ask the same rules for everyone. That some platforms that are becoming extremely critical, they're becoming almost like a privately owned infrastructure to the economic life of, uh, of industry, sectors, nations, and globally. Uh, that they have to be regulated in a way that they cannot just be self-serving, right? And that is the debate that is happening at the moment. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned briefly the fact that we create and we capture value. So when consumer, when users consume services, uh, uh, which are digital services, like, for example, when I'm driving and I'm looking at Google Maps or Apple Maps or Waze, I'm consuming uh, value, uh, the service, but at the same time, I am giving away my position, my speed, my direction. And so I am becoming a data point that feeds into that system. And there is value that is created by this feedback loop between, uh, between the consuming data and, and, and generating data. So users are not just passive users. They use data and they generate data. Something very interesting about data is like, it's not like a glass of water that once I drink it, there's no more water left for somebody else to drink. Data does not get depleted as it is consumed. And so I can use the data and Henrique can use the data and Mariana can use the data. The data is still available to be used by someone else. Data is similar to knowledge in that way. So the data as output can be used as further input to improve the service, but also not just the data can be used to improve the service further, like in the case of Waze. It can be used to profile users. So as we all know, and Google and Facebook and others, they know an awful lot about us. They know, you know, uh, our gender. Uh, they know where we live. Uh, they know how many, probably how many kids we have. They know uh, our political opinions. They know our state of health. They know what we look for on the internet. And that creates a lot of opportunity, yes, to create value by combining these data sets, to feed into machine learning algorithm and create more prediction and perhaps more targeted advertising. But really, was that the internet really only created? What is that the best we can do with it with the internet? Is, 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 it, is it the best way to organize and to uh, to continue to sustain these wonderful technologies? We uh, we are that we witnessing a growing awareness of, of the of the almost obscene wealth of um, of some of these entrepreneurs. And, 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 and the polarization between the centralization of value capture and the, and the fragmentation of, of value generation. And in a way, we see these companies becoming governors. They are becoming governors of their own ecosystem. They decide the rules, for example, the terms and references that decide who they can uh, deplatformize or keep on the platform. They can change the rules. And what they are really becoming are governors of ecosystems, which are not just markets or sectors, which are cutting across different sectors and which are cutting across different geographies. So a question that I ask is who is going to govern the governors? Because the power of platform, the, fa the fact that they have become so central into our lives, uh, and they have not become central by, by usurping that centrality, they have earned a position of centrality because of the tremendous value that they have created. But the question is, once the markets have tipped and we, have, we are seeing a small number of monopolists uh, in, firmly in place, they have all the incentives in the world to keep their position of dominance and their position of centrality. And therefore, there is a question of trust, uh, which is a legitimate question. To which extent should we trust them uh, to do what's right for the collectivity? And as we understand, they are private enterprises. Yes, of course, there is some alignment in terms of if they were to do things that were bad for everyone and everybody could collaborate and could uh, decide together we're going to switch off the platform. 
probably people would abandon the platform. But it's uh, it's it's um, it's uh, the situation that we have now is that is that there is very little collective action among among the users of the platform, and that's why we see government stepping stepping into 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 the situation and and looking at a variety of abuses of power, whether in antitrust, whether about surveillance and privacy. Also, with regard to um, work and labor relationship, and there is there is a lot of uh, dependency of workers who are who have uh, very low wages and uh, are in precarious relationship with the platform, which does not admit or acknowledge that they are an employer. And uh, there is a lot of pushback currently happening in a way that I think is is quite legitimate. Uh, now that the, these abuses are becoming more more visible, so this is just a slide summarizing the point I was making between a, um, a transaction and innovation platform. Uh, I've clarified that uh, platforms uh, bring together market size and generate value through network effect. Uh, from a strategic perspective, they have to know how to start. Which side do you bring on board first? first slide or second slide, economists call that the chicken and egg problem. So um, uh, Mariana was mentioning that I've I've, uh, I've developed a, a, I've written a document together with Nick Srinicek for the European Parliament, which uh, was published recently, which is a 150 page um, uh, uh, report, which is uh, freely accessible on the, on the European uh, Parliament website, looking at the economic effect and the societal effects of platforms. And what we see is that, this is just a very quick summary, yes, they facilitate connections through network effect. We see innovative business models. Many of them require subsidization of one side to attract multiple other sides, and they facilitate transactions and innovation. That's great. There is lots of positive effect on consumers, businesses, competition, and innovation. If these platforms offered useless services, nobody would use them. So we have to acknowledge that the high usage reflects not only addiction, yes, there is some addiction, but also there is a lot of value that is being created. And they also invest quite a lot in R&D. But there has been negative effects on consumers and businesses, as well as on competition and innovation, that is due to the centrality and dominance that is being the result of this network effect dynamic. So they're becoming gatekeepers, and there have been instances of antitrust violation. In Europe, uh, there were three antitrust lawsuits against Google, big, big fines. But we talk about fines in absolute terms, but in terms of the relative uh, the relative cons- the relative effect it has on the companies such as Alphabet, Google, which has such a deep pocket, we have been able to, we have been forced to see that the, the 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 effect of all this antitrust has not been positive and has not have had much effect we still have the same monopolist in place there is an increasing concern as to what is called killer acquisitions so we've seen because those platform companies have so, so many financial so much financial resources they have been acquiring tons and tons of startups and other companies. Uh, some people say that's great. The, the entrepreneurs really are becoming rich. And that, in fact, incentivize entrepreneurs to be even more innovative because they will know they will be bought by Google or bought by Amazon. Uh, other observers are more concerned. And I say this: these patterns of acquisition is really to prevent rivals to step in and gobble them up because, before they can become uh, uh, potential rivals, and many people think that that uh, in retrospect, Facebook uh, should not have been allowed to uh, acquire Instagram and WhatsApp. There are effects of employment. I mentioned new jobs, but also flexibility and precarity. And a lot of the risks are being shifted to the workers. If you're if you're sick, well, you have to pay for that. If you have a if you have an accident, that is your problem. And workers are also ongoing uh, um, uh, subject to ongoing surveillance, monitoring, and control. So we see an increase, uh, which is very worrisome, about really a modality of constant surveillance. And those who are the poorest or have the uh, lowest uh, types of uh, skills are becoming more vulnerable, and it's a lot more easy to become exploited. So there is a real social concern about how to preserve social rights in a digital economy, which is really fueled by a very strong uh, profit uh, profit uh, um, 
motive. And there is a lack of collective organization. A number of these platforms uh, do not allow uh, the, they don't call them their workers, but the, 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 the members of the, of the platform who actually do work, they don't allow them to unionize. Uh, so there is also effect on consumers and societal risks, such as a lack of accountability, uh, their privacy risks, uh, online harm, and this concern about becoming a surveillance society, to use the terms of Shoshana Zuboff. And we all have been aware of the problem associated with fake news and um, amplification of hateful content, um, uh, and which can, if, if elections are being manipulated, uh, created danger to, to democracy. So there's been an acknowledgement of, of challenges in the space of regulation, of limits of, of traditional antitrust, and accumulation of data, uh, with violation of privacy and competition, uh, avoidance for sectoral uh, regulation, and illegal and harmful content. And I think I will just finish with this one slide, because I, I think I don't want to take too much time. Uh, in the report, I present a few policy options um, to try to mitigate uh, the, 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 the problems associated with platforms while trying to keep the good sides of platform. So um, the, the report uh, actually supports the European proposition of, uh, of um, a European and also UK proposition of, of a pro-competitive regulatory framework. So instead of relying on antitrust that happens after the damages have been done and after the market has been structured and there is one monopolist and there's nothing to do anymore, to put some rules in the game uh, to before uh, the market tip, to provide a set of rules by which um, uh, platforms have to obey. And uh, I think it's important to base the, the rules on, on principles that are being representative of democratic value and that, that the, the parliaments can uphold, such as ensuring freedom of competition, uh, strengthening competition rules for merger control, uh, ensuring fairness of intermediation, and so ensuring sovereignty of decision making that has to do with not allowing companies to manipulate uh, and to um, uh, to influence uh, uh, the users uh, knowingly against the benefits of the users. And I think the devil will be in the detail. It's very important that there will be a, a robust and adaptive set of enforcement mechanisms. Because one thing to write uh, principles and rules, it's another to actually implement it. And this is a very dynamic a set of industry and industry players. So the difficulty of, 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 of the law is that it can be taking a long time and being very static. So we need to find a way to, uh, to, to, to resource adequately um, the regulatory agencies that are going to be charged with monitoring these. these. Uh, there were in the report some policy options on working conditions and labor market uh, that's, that asks to set minimum wages and to redefine the category of employee and to suggest that those who work for platforms should be considered employees, which gives some responsibility to the platforms as employer. Obviously, uh, there's pushback from the platforms for these uh, rules because that would increase their cost because they would have to pay some social security and some insurance, and therefore that would cut directly into their bottom line. Uh, but it's important to extend workers' rights over their own data and, and circumscribe the way they can be monitored and surveilled and evaluated on the basis of their work. Um, and there is some uh, some uh, um, uh, also proposition to support platform cooperatives. Uh, for societal risk and environmental sustainability, we propose in the report to support transition to uh, greener mobility platforms that are uh, mindful of the climate change uh, challenges that we are facing. And in the context of COVID and the pandemic, to keep the, the, the measures that have been exceptional measures of support for platform workers, to keep them beyond beyond the pandemic. So from the, I would like to conclude uh, with, with this slide, if that's okay. I had prepared more, but I think that's plenty enough content. So I think we should uh, build together a new way to regulate these platforms. These are the new governors of the digital economy. We need to have a set of rules that are going to be uh, business friendly, but society friendly to keep uh, to keep a human centric view of uh, of uh, of how digital uh, technologies are going to be used uh, so we need a constructive dialogue between the regulators and the big tech and 
civil society. And also, I'm an academic, more collaborations across academic silos, um, social sciences, data sciences, um, technology. Um, uh, there needs to be a lot more dialogue across across these silos. And I think a, a, a group such as yourself can play a very important role of education and and uh, and, uh, and 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 dialogue and advocacy. So I, I will stop here. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, thanks a lot for making this comprehensive presentation. And I also like it very much that both in your presentation and in your report, you come up with very specific policy options. And I think that sets the ground for uh, important conversation that we have to have. Um, I'll start by making some questions of my own. We have some uh, questions from the audience too that I'm also going to address. But there's one thing that I wanted to hear from you a bit more. Uh, you're speaking of policy options, and I'm aware that in your report you were addressing the European Parliament, of course. Uh, but because we're speaking of platforms who, as you say, are new government governors in ecosystems that span both markets and countries, one of the things that I think it would be really inter interesting to hear you talk about more uh, is how you see the limits of national legislation or how you see the role that international coordination would have, if any. And um, I'm asking that also thinking of, of course, or particular interest as developing economies and thinking also of potential extraterritorial effects of legislation that's developed uh, in developed economies when we're speaking of platforms that operate globally. Much of this, much of these legislations, they end up having effects in other countries as well. So one of the things that we have to think of when we're thinking globally is how all those things play out together, right? So that's something that I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about. And uh, I'll take the opportunity to also bring one of the questions that we're getting from the audience. This is one from Marcio Migon. He is uh, a counselor of CGI. He was speaking here before. Um, he's asked the following question. Both the broker or intermediary, as well as civil liability in the production chain, are not new microeconomic problems. So his question is, what is new? in this digital environment of platforms and how to deal with these news. Uh, I think you addressed this a bit in your talk, but- if why, don't I, why don't I just start with that? Because that's easy, right? Okay. Yes, the notion of being an intermediary is not new at all. We've always had, you know, ladies who would go in the village and try to find a, uh, a, a, a potential marriage uh, for marriage, you know, one boy from one family and one girl from one family. We've always had real estate uh, people who are playing the role of intermediaries. So it's a very good question that, that you know, being an intermediary is not new. What is new is intermediary with the injection of network effects. And the network effects comes from the connectivity that, that the digital economy allows. And the network effect means that the more people you have on one side, the more it attracts people on the other side. So it's not just an intermediary, it is an intermediary on steroids that becomes an intermediary to the whole world. So the, that's the difference. It's a, it's a question of scale, okay? That, and I hope I answered that question. Now, uh, Mariana, you have, you pose a very, very important question, and I don't have the answer to that question. I can just tell you a beginning of, of a small number of ideas. Uh, the global context that you describe, right, where you have, you know, the north and then the, and then the global south, you know, some countries have more power than other. That is the background within which this whole new digital economy and digital situation is happening, okay? So, you know, what we see here is the emergence of a new form of power, okay? It's a new form of power. It's not a power of weaponry like, you know, uh, the Emperor Napoleon had, you know? 
it, it, it's not a traditional uh, economic kind of power like, you know, post World War II, the United States. It is a power which is both economic but also social that doesn't really care much about the borders of, and the geographies. So, so, so that's why some people think that, you know, uh, some people think that these, these companies are becoming more powerful than some countries. No. Uh, I think Denmark is the first country that actually appointed an ambassador to the technology companies. So treating those big technology companies as countries. Right. So what we see so far is that platforms... Yes, they raise the level playing field for everyone. Everyone has access to more capacity, more innovation. And it's an empirical question. It's still an open question to know, is that going to increase or decrease the gap in wealth between emerging economies and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, more established economies? Okay. I think this depends which part of the world you look at. There is this interesting paper that I've uh, uh, just published with uh, called Plat uh, in the Information Systems Journals, and I'm happy to share it with uh, with everyone um, in the in the chat. Uh, the first author is Carla Bonina, and it's written by uh, it's written uh, by um, uh, her uh, 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 and, and 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 other co-authors. Uh, Mr. Koskinen and Ben Eaton and myself, that specifically looks at uh, that specifically looks at the uh, the impact of digital platforms for for development. Okay, China is a different story than you know Africa or South America. China has done extremely well, and in many ways, it's it's it's, it's ahead of the United States and certainly of Europe in terms of platforms coming from Tencent and, and Alibaba, okay? Uh, Mercado Libre is a very interesting example of a platform that comes from, from South America. Uh, uh, but we haven't seen from other, uh, from other emerging economies uh, any, any platform that really has become so successful and so dominant. By the way, Europe hasn't done very well either despite all uh, the infrastructures and the skills, okay? But I think the game is not over. I think the game is not over. I think we are only at the beginning of a new wave. We've only seen uh, the new organizations that have been the first one who really understand what they can do with digital technologies, what they can do with the internet, how they can create value once everyone has in their hand a mobile phone. And they have started a race and they've made a lot of progress and showed the world what can be done, in particular using advertising-based business models. Now there is a backlash against this because of the surveillance, the manipulation. And so that creates opportunities for creativity and for innovation to create the next generation of platforms that will offer similar services than the one that are offering today, but to find better ways to deal with privacy issues and to respect social rights. And I am actually optimistic. I think uh, developing countries have a fantastic card to play uh, there by taking advantage of the existing technology, by having large populations who want to, uh, to get ahead, okay? And uh, if you look at, for example, the adoption of mobile telephony in emerging industries, this has been really, really high and has provided internet connection to people who didn't even have, uh, you know, access to other kinds of infrastructures. So I think the new uh, regulation that are coming into place, which will force some kind of interoperability, which will, uh, I think, make these private infrastructure more open for access and for innovation to others, 
I think that will be a tremendous opportunity where, uh, you know, the creativity of, uh, of, of emerging industries, of emerging economies, where you have lots of young people as well, can play a, a very positive role. Now, to answer your question about international cooperation, I have to say it would be great, but I'm not very optimistic. Because I think the, 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 the existing governments, as I said, are on the back foot anyway with regard to these platforms. And even before the platforms, there was not such a fantastic international cooperation between the governments. So I, 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 don't see, I don't see that we should wait for international cooperation on regulation to come up with new and better ways. I have more uh, trust into uh, entrepreneurial activities, uh, cooperation through the internet of creating different solutions and different ways to, 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 to create the platforms of tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks for being candid too about that, Arabelle. Um, let me dig into something else, uh, which I think you mentioned pretty clearly in your report, uh, but is you, you didn't have as much time to address in detail in this presentation. I think it's an important topic to discuss, which is that you mentioned how platforms avoid sectoral regulations right mm -hmm. so they avoid to be treated as um let's say uh as hotels let's say uh, uh uh housing platform or something doesn't want to be treated as hotel as a hotel or uh streaming platforms they don't want to be regulated as a traditional music industry is or the audiovisual industry is and i think it would be interesting to hear more about what you think of the experiences of sectoral regulations because you were mentioning what's similar to all platforms and this necessity of uh, thinking of overarching legal frameworks. Right. But how do you see the role of sectoral regulation as well? Or when would that uh, be the case? When should right. we be pursuing that? Right, right. So that's a really interesting question again, uh, Mariana. Um, so we have observed, right, that many platforms have tried to escape or evade sectoral regulation. So, for example, um, you know, in the early days of Uber, Uber would say, we are not a transportation company. We're just a technological platform. So please don't force us to abide by the rules of this particular sector. Or in the early days, Airbnb said the same thing. We are not in that situation anymore, okay? Nobody buys that argument anymore. There has been a lot of pushback. And these companies are more and more abiding by sectoral regulation. However, we also have to understand that the sectors themselves are changing. So, so what should be the new rules considering that the activity is different? Let me give you an example. It's not always easy. Think about regulation over television content, okay? When I grew up in France, there was a regulation that said that there is a certain kind of films, a certain kind of content that was more uh, for adults. You know, I remember there was a little white rectangle at the corner of the, of the film. Should not be accessible, you could not broadcast that content before 10 p.m. at night, okay? So you can make a regulation about a sort of, you cannot, uh, you, you can force by regulation a television station not to program content after 10 p.m. at night when it's using the technology of television broadcasting. Can you apply the same rule on the internet when the time your people access on demand and the time um, is different depending on where you are on, on, you know, all over the world. So you can see that 
you have to go back to the principle of what was the rule trying to achieve, right? It was trying to achieve a uh, protection of a young population because at that time it was considered by society that, you know, seeing highly sexual or highly violent content should not be allowed for this population, okay? So I think what has to happen is not just a dogmatic application of the rules of yesterday to the new actors, because sometimes it will work and sometimes it doesn't even make sense. But the reinterpretation, going back to first principle, as to what it is that regulation is trying to achieve. So if what we're trying to achieve as a society is protection of youngsters or protection of vulnerable, and we understand that uh, we need to limit to some extent exposition to this content, there may be new rules that will have to happen, but they just cannot be the same rules. Because now the content is not uh, necessarily generated by the station. It can be user-generated content that is happening on the platform. And therefore, the modalities of control and the allocation of rights from the state to the platforms or not as to who is really liable. Or should there be a third party, like a government agency, checking what is allowed and what is not allowed? The modalities of control have to be reinvented. And we have to have processes to put in place to decide what those new rules are, and not even those new rules are forever, you know, engraved in marble, but to have a system in place that will be able to revisit as technologies and services will advance and will change, how to revisit those rules on a more continuous basis. So I guess my answer to you is a little more nuanced than just to say, yes, we have to apply existing sectoral regulation. I think we have on the one hand to be real, to, to realize that there was quite a lot of opportunism and to some extent cynicism from companies which are trying, and it is understandable, to, uh, to be as profitable as possible within the limits of the law and the existing law. And they have taken advantage of a regulatory vacuum simply because these types of activities were not yet understood and there were no rules so, you know, it's like the far west in the beginning. Everybody goes in with a gun and, and you know, uh, and, 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 and the rules is in the hand of the, of the actors. We are now in a different phase. I think there will be new sectors anyway, and there will be new regulation. It may not be as simple as the sectors of yesterday, because, you know, what is, what is, you know, some of the sectors, we don't really know what they are. You know, yesterday, Amazon uh, purchased uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. So, you know, Amazon already a few years ago purchased uh, uh, Whole Foods. So what's the sector that Amazon is in? You know, is it supermarkets of organic food? Is it, uh, is it uh, mostly a delivery company? Or, or is it a, a, a Hollywood studio, right? And so um, that's where we see also that regulation applies to activities. Should it apply to activities? Should it apply to companies? These, these debates are not resolved. But we need to have a pragmatic attitude to understand and go back to the principles of what it is we're trying to protect, what it is we're trying to achieve, and how do we find a, a workable way to make progress towards this goal, given the very dynamic economic and technological environment we are in. But the concepts such as sectors, markets, firms, they don't completely help understand the phenomenon. And that's why I spent some time at the beginning of my presentation to talk about those other concepts, ecosystems, network effects, complementarities, these will have to be embedded into new theories of, uh, of how these, uh, these uh, industries operate and eventually will make their way into new regulation. That's really good, Annabelle. And I just want to plug here a very short question from José Antonio Gouveia Galhardo from the audience. It mm -hmm. speaks to what you were saying, but perhaps you want to add. 
he asks about the timing to regulate, which he thinks it uh, seems to be the problem. Because when a business appears in a legal vacuum, and you were mentioning that, and offers public value to the point of being dominant, how do you resolve the negative outcomes? So if you could shortly address that, he has another That's question. I understand the question. Can you summarize it for me again? Sorry. Yeah. He he is asking about the timing of regulation. The problem is that... Saying, uh, is, he, is he asking whether regulation is taking too long? Is that the question? I don't think so. I think that the, the issue is uh, that companies appear in a vacuum uh, and the negative outcomes appear later. And you mentioned that in your presentation too, uh, that you end up seeing the results after because of the whole structure of innovation. Well, that's, why, that's why the current regulation is trying to be ex ante as opposed to ex post. That's why, that's why at least the direction of travel in Europe, not yet in the United States, and I don't know what the status is in, in South America or in Asia, although in Asia there start to be movements towards regulation as well, um, I think regulators are aware of the of of, of the issues, and uh, and they are and they are trying to 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 come up with the appropriate regulation now. But it's always the case that regulation happens after a new phenomenon happens, and that's actually a good thing. We we don't want the laws to come before the phenomenon actually develops to some extent. We don't want to constrain it too much from the get go. Okay, I think that's a very clear answer. <laughs> and uh, I have another one from Enrique here. Uh, he is also asking uh, what your opinion on regulating content platforms or platforms that are based on user-generated content and those proposals to promote interoperability by opening uh data sets to uh, other competitors so that new platforms can compete with the more established ones? If you could address uh, yes, that I will kind start of proposals. With interoperability. I will start with the interoperability. So I am absolutely favorable to rules that will uh, facilitate interoperability. Uh, this is very important to facilitate uh, competition in, in markets and to facilitate innovation on, in ways that are compatible with the, with the, with the, with the standard um, of interconnection. Uh, every time there was interoperability that was mandated, whether in the um, in, uh, telecommunication industry uh, before, or, or in other industries, it has been very positive. This said, we have to recognize that interoperability in the context of digital platforms is not as simple as it looks. It's not so easy as just to design an electric plug because whereas uh, uh, electricity, the nature of electricity is such that you know, you have electrons going on different kind of uh, on different kind of, uh, of 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 physical medium, and you can just decide: is it you know the frequency and the and the and the and the and the, the modality? You know, and yes, you had standards war. I mean, there was this very famous war in the United States between the Edison system and, and the Westinghouse system. You know, AC DC, and eventually there was a standard and. And all your electric uh, appliances, when you go to um, to a particular country, are all standardized. So what interoperability does is that it mandates uh, an, uh, uh, an opening of some interface that becomes standards. Now, when you have data sets which are in different formats, that becomes a little bit complicated. Although it can be done, there was, for example, in, in banking uh, in, in the UK, there was a very a, a successful initiative called Open Banking that forced interoperability in the context of data, that forced existing uh, banks to allow access to data set of their consumers, to allow this access to fintech and to new banks. Okay, then there is a lot to learn about about the way it happened. What can we learn from the lessons? What worked? What didn't work? But it's certainly possible. So yes, yes for interoperability, absolutely. And I forgot the rest of the question. It had to do with content platforms. Uh, if in the oh, case yes. of so, yeah, what's the question? Who should regulate content? How should it be done? No, regarding uh, 
the platforms that are based on you know, user generated content how can you make them interoperable or what uh what issues could arise it's a big it's a big too big the question you know i mean there are lots of issues around uh what are the incentives for for example social media platforms to regulate more the content Right, so they have been saying they're trying, and they have used AI and other and, and armies of uh, of human uh, moderators uh, to try to uh, to moderate some of the content or take it away. It's quite a difficult thing to do for some kind of offenses like bullying, because the words the, the meaning depends on the context. Sometimes they get it wrong, so they censor one group, but actually they are more more democratic way, and they actually have the dictator in place. Um, so they haven't gotten it right too much. And even if there is a decline into the trust of users towards this platform, it hasn't yet come to hurting this platform's profitability and bottom line. So maybe, maybe they don't realize yet, but they will have to self-regulate a lot more. And I think they are starting to realize that. If only because they will be more afraid that there will be top-down government intervention that is going to be so strong that that they will uh, that they will uh, uh, that it will impact them more negatively. But I hear different views. Some some analysts that I speak to tell me that uh, the biggest companies have so many resources that this regulatory activity is just a little bit of noise in the corner and they pretend they're scared of it, but they're really not because their profits, their, their install base is becoming larger and larger and they're becoming even more essential to the functioning of the economy. And we've seen, for example, with uh, with COVID, how, I mean, that how governments have relied on them and how we have relied on them, you know, with the, for example, uh, you know, contact and trace application. But the problem of, of regulating content is a big question. My quick answer yeah. to that is that we will see, and I, I hope very much that we will see social media platforms understanding it, it, it is in their own self-interest to take this very seriously and to, uh, and to do a better job at it. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, I have so many questions from the audience, but we're reaching the time limit for this panel, so I'll have to close, even though we could carry this discussion, I think, for still a few hours. There are many things that arise from what we're saying, especially in the last answer. At the same time, I think this is a cycle that's opening discussions, not closing them. So I think it's a good thing that we close with so many questions still pending, because we'll certainly need this intellectual and political energy for the discussions yet to come. So I'll thank Annabelle again for the time and dedication to being here and answering all these questions. Thank the audience for being so attentive and sending all these good questions. I'm sorry we've not been able to address them, but we'll have other opportunities. I'll now invite Migon and Enrique back so they can make their closing remarks to the session and to the cycle as a whole. Thank you, everyone. Okay, okay. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Annabelle. This has been a great lecture. Uh, it's really exciting to see the themes uh, so well organized and, and, and systematized uh, that, that helping us uh, by virtue of that uh, to, to really entertain productive discussions, uh, which is the reason why we're promoting uh, these series of, of roundtables uh, that that should, uh, in the near future, uh, feed our uh, uh, domestic debate around the, the uh, such a fascinating and complex theme. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I really liked uh, to learn that I mean coming from more traditional industries uh, where supply chain uh, relationships and and even network effects are explored in a slightly different way, uh, given that I come from the air transport industry. Uh, it, it's really it, it, it's really curious uh, to see the analogies and the differences uh, that the internet brings uh, uh, to, to, to reality if we consider more traditional uh, forms of communications and, and human interaction and relationships. Uh, I really like the... I mean, your vision uh, with regards to innovation, uh, we really can't let 
uh, excessive regulation by any means uh, prevent innovation. And, and we really have to find ways that, uh, I mean, uh, let, let, let the ecosystem flourish uh, with uh, enabling new entrants uh, and, and not imposing regulations perhaps that only the incumbents uh, have the ability to, to cope with. So thank you very much. This has been great food for thought and I really look forward to, to carrying on with this debate. Uh, thank you, Mariana, and congratulations, Enrique, once again, for putting together uh, such an interesting panel and, 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 and more than that, uh, such a useful and opportunistic, uh, I mean, timely uh, in, 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 in such a way uh, that, that this has been kind of brought, brought forward. Thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Obrigado, Migon. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Anabelli. I will speak in Portuguese. I'm just closing the, this panel and this, this first series of uh, seminars about that, that issue in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you so much to Professor Anabel, Mariana, and to our participants. Well, this was a very fruitful and interesting cycle of debates. Maybe we should have inverted the order of our talks. Professor Annabelle was amazing. And maybe as she gave us an overview about the platforms, data, and all the efforts that have been made to try to regulate them. Having said that, thank you so much for your participation. And let's keep going forward. Let's try to fill out the gaps and try to solve uh, our major issues. Thank you again and wish you all a grateful evening to you, Annabelle. Thank you.